Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Talking Triathlon Podcast, where we get together to talk all about the sport of triathlon. My name is Tim Ford, and this week I have a different co-host because uh, James Bell dropped on me at the 11th hour that he would not be able to join this week. So I thought, who can I get on? And I know that we had a, such a positive reaction to our chat with Max and Kate the other day. I thought, Max Stapley, I'm going to get you back on the podcast. How are you going, mate? Very well, thank you. How are you? Good, thanks. Uh, since we last spoke, you have uh, you have things have changed a little bit. You've got a a victory under your under your belt now, winning the Laguna Phuket Triathlon. What was it two weeks ago? How's that feel, mate? Yeah, I mean, it feels obviously. It's, it's like I said on another show. It's few and far in between. For you know, it's not easy to win a race. So so to get a win, especially like such an iconic, iconic race, iconic venue, historic palmares of people that have won it. It's it's a pretty good feeling, you know. It, it truly is like, I think a lot of people maybe who are outside of the Asia Pacific region uh, don't realize just how significant a race is. But when you actually look at the list of previous winners, it's like, it's a good, it's a good um, list to be concluded on, right? That you've got the likes of Jan Fredino, Chris McCormack, you know, um, like so many guys, both men and women as well, who, who have gone and won this iconic race. Like it really, I mean, they call it the race of legends. So does that mean I have to refer to you as a legend now, mate? Like, how does that work? Oh, well, I'll have to, I think I'll have to win it a couple more times to be an official legend, but no, definitely. Like when you walk into the kind of compound where the start finish area is, you have big walls, like a bit kind of Noosa ish with the previous winners and stuff. And you see kind of Greg Welsh, Fredino, Maka, Belinda Granger, uh, all these people. And you just think to yourself, damn, like that's, that's pretty cool. Like if I do nothing else, at least I'll always be on the board at Laguna Phuket. <laughs> and I can say like, I won that flip and raise boys. Like I'm a legend. <laughs> and it is I, again, it's, it's a right. I've done the race. I've done that. I've been there four times. I did the sprint one year, but they've done the, the, the four race three times. And it's, it's like, you will it's a fucking horribly brutal race, but there's something so like, there's not enough of these sort of, I think really tough races out there anymore. Like you finish it and when you're doing it, it's like, this is what I've made the biggest mistake in my life. Like, why am I doing this? But you finish and you're like, nah, I achieved something. Like I actually, like there's this real sense of accomplishment when you finish that race. No, definitely. I, for me, it kind of feels like a hallmark of what traditional triathlon is. You know, when you think back to like skinny kind of alloy, alloy frames, guys on extender bars, like in speedos and singlet racing up like Garmin Hill and Noosa or racing Laguna Phuket or racing uh, the, you know, Kona, like you, you talk about, again, I don't want to blow steam at my own ass, but it, it is kind of like a, one of them races that people say, oh, new, you know, I'd love to win Noosa. I'd love to win Laguna. I'd love to win Kona. I'd love to win, you know, New York triathlon, like these kind of hallmark races that have a legacy and have a history and have a story. And I think that's something that's really massively lacking today in the kind of triathlon world, especially the short course world, because it is it is more of a like it's closer to an Olympic distance than it is to a 70.3. So you could argue it's it's a good hybrid between a long and a short and it, and it does have that history to it. So you can tell a story, you can look back, you can look at times. It's exactly the same course, exactly the same everything. And and I just think we need more of that. And, and, and I hope we see, I hope we see that, that grow. And I, and I hope that race keeps going for another 29 years, you know, like it, it'd be great. I know that for myself, you know, I've been doing the sport now for too long, but I have like this list of races that I've always wanted to do. And it, like the longer that I've left it without doing them, a lot of them seem to vanish. And I know that even for myself, like one of the races that I always really wanted to do is called beach to battleship. And I got, I just sort of assumed, oh, I guess I'm never going to be able to do that race. And I did um, North Carolina 70.3 a few years ago and had no idea, but that was actually beach to battleship because you oh. start on the beach and, you, and then uh, in Wilmington in North Carolina, where races, there's this full on battleship sitting in the harbor. And it was such a cool, be like, oh, fuck, I actually, I, I've ticked one of these races off my list. So um, so many of those iconic races uh, sort of do seem to sort of vanish or get renamed or sort of the history lost a little bit. And it is it is a little bit sad. Um, but it is good to see those iconic events like Laguna, like Noosa, uh, thriving. And again, I would encourage anybody who is listening, who hasn't like Phuket is such a great place to train and to, to do the race is awesome. It's, it's just a fantastic triathlon, like week or two weeks, however you want to do it. Uh, you're still there at the moment though, aren't you? Yeah. Still kicking about, you know, I won, so I've decided to just buy a house here, stay here <laughs> and never leave. Like just take your winnings while you can, mate. Just, you know. What's the point? What's the point in going back to Europe? Like I'm the king of Thailand now, so. Well, that's that, that, I, I did see you. Um, you've, you've been getting a bit of press over there, but I, it, it really is such a good um spot. Like we did a fair bit of training together when I was over there. I took you guys on some of the, my favorite loops up there. Like that James Bond loop we did, me, you, Kate, and uh, Lucy is, is one of the best bike rides I think 
I mean, you live in you live in you know Banyoles near Girona, so that's like, you know, probably the best place I've ever in a bike. But to me, Phuket is a is a pretty you know pretty close second place in, in terms of places that I've been riding a bike. And yeah, I, I really love training in Phuket. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, and 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 obviously, like you do, kind of get those main road times, but you also feel I never feel in danger, so to speak. Whereas yeah. you know, people give you room, they never honk, they never you never feel under duress or under pressure on the road, which is which is a rare thing for like a big main road, right? Because you do yeah. have to take main arteries to get to quieter places. And there's not a single time, as long as you stay left, that you feel down, I'm, gonna about, I'm about to get cleared up here, which which is what you feel in a lot of countries where where we've trained or, or gone to racing. You just feel you feel unsafe and you never feel that here in Thailand. And, and that's a huge, a huge benefit when you're trying to log the miles, I guess. Oh, and again, the story that I always tell was in 2017, I was there doing a big block of training myself and I had a crash on that main road just after the bridge that comes back to the Phuket Island. And I, I hit one of those um, reflectors and went down in the, and I ended up in the middle of the highway and a truck missed me by 15 centimeters, probably like, I remember looking up thinking, Oh, okay, this was a good run. And yeah. I swear the only reason that I actually survived and didn't get run over by a truck was because this truck seen a cyclist on the left. And just because he's courteous has moved over to the far lane to give me as much room as possible. And thank God he did, because otherwise I would have ended up directly under his his wheels when I came down. I, I mean, I'm just thinking that if I had had that exact same crash in Australia, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, yeah. And it, it it just, again, sort of, that's the best example I can give of why I enjoy training and riding so much in a country like Thailand, because there is just this level of respect that you don't seem to find in a lot of other places. No, I definitely agree. Definitely agree. And, and, and I guess it's not, you know, when people kind of say, oh, Southeast Asia, you kind of think like rough and tumble, rock and roll, baby, but it is in a way, but also there is that kind of respect that you don't, you don't find maybe in the UK. Like I remember I got a bloody glass bottle thrown at me, like in the last week I was in Leeds and I just thought to myself, this is ridiculous. This is not worth it. And, and you come here and you never even experience that feeling of like, you know, when someone comes slightly too close and you get that shiver and you go, Oh, you know, and mm. I haven't had that for a month, which is so, so nice. Cause you just think to yourself, well, I can ride whenever, wherever, and I'll come back safely, hopefully touch wood, you know, but yeah. The only issue you have is the weather because it can turn on a dime. Like as I, I, we were talking yesterday and I, I was like, what the fuck is that noise? You're like, it is absolutely pissing down. I've had to pull over because it's yeah, actually yeah. dangerous to ride. And that's it. But it lasts for like 10 minutes and then it sort of goes like, that's the other thing. And then it's just hot as fuck afterwards. Yeah. Uh, but uh, look, yeah. enough, enough praising Phuket. Uh, this podcast, as I said, is Talking Triathlon. Uh, if you guys enjoy the podcast and want to support the podcast, head to patreon.com forward slash Talking Triathlon. We do a bonus monthly episode. We recorded one this week. We've actually renamed it. We've called it the rumor mill now because because all we seem to do is talk about the rumors we hear in the sport that we can't probably publicly verbalize on this podcast. So we uh, we put it behind a paywall and those people who are sort of the cool kids who want to know the inside scoop, that's where they go, five bucks a month. Yeah, there's a WhatsApp group, a Facebook group, but that's where you can go. Got to get that out of the way. Now, mate, uh, there's a bunch of stuff happening. And again, you're not an interviewee this week. I was telling you, you've been uh, elevated to official co-host of the podcast this week. Good, uh, good promotion. So what happens when you are part of the legends of uh, Laguna Phuket Triathlon. Uh, but Considering it is quite late in the year and you think there isn't that much happening, there has been a fair amount of stuff happening in the world of triathlon. And I thought the best place to start would be an article I saw this week, uh, which was Christian Blumenfeld saying that he believes in order to win the Paris Olympics, you're going to have to run a sub 29, 10 kilometer uh, run off the bike. What do you reckon? Yeah, I'd agree. I, I think I'd even push that out further. I'd think, I think you're looking at sub 2830. Jesus um, Christ, that's fast. Yeah, I just, I think given the course dynamics and I know a lot of people were saying, Oh, there's going to be a break or the French are going to try this or the Germans are going to try this. Uh, if you look at the f physics and the speed that you have to go to stay away from a main group and the power required to stay away, it seems quasi impossible apart from if there's a, you know, a race incident such as a crash or a big current that really, really splits the groups. Um, it seems like it's going to be at least a 30, 25, 30 man group. So coming off that ride, you know, you'll have pushed maybe 250 normalized, 260 normalized, which is zone two at best. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be, it, it, it'll literally just be a swim, a blow dry and a run in my opinion. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, you've got a guy like Alex Yee, 2751, 10K, Hayden, Christian, Leo, Conings, Studer, all these guys that are all sub 29 minute 10K runners. And I don't think that, a hard 1500 and a, and a cruisy 40 K is going to affect their running legs. So what's a, what's a 29, two, so a 29 minute 10 K is 1430 twice through 
which is just over 253s. Yeah, I think it's going to be faster than that. I think it's going to be 28.30 for the win. I saw that in an article that was um, a Norwegian publication where they were they were doing testing on Christian and, and uh, um, Olav was saying that he's already at a better level than he was uh, pre pre Tokyo, which is good. But I suppose as well, this it's you know it's a few years later and the sport has probably elevated a bit since then. Um, do you think we're going to see Christian in that sort of shape to win the thing, or do you think that it has the Ironman cost him too much, or what do you think about that? Well, first of all, Christian always barks. His bark seems to be worse than his bite over the last two years, so. I mean, Olaf can say what he wants from his hut in Morocco, but at the end of the day, he's got to do it, right? So he was seventh this year or ninth, or I can't really remember where he was in the test event. He wasn't with that main group. And yeah, arguably he'd been training for 70.3, but I just, I just when I look at Hayden and Alex, in my opinion, that they're, they're, they're just a bit above that group behind. And then you got that group behind with Lacour, Conings, Berger, Luis, if he's back on form, uh, a couple Germans, maybe Tyler Misselchuk, if he has a good run. Um, I just, I just don't, I don't see where Christian's getting the kind of, and I mean, I respect it. Like he's an Olympic champion. You have to give him his credit, but I don't, I don't see where he's getting his, his kind of reference point for thinking that he can run with Alex, especially the way Alex absolutely demonstrated that he was far and beyond above anyone in Paris. Like that was the first time that I think we saw Alex full throttle. Because I and think, he did it solo, by the way. Like he did, yeah. he wasn't even pushed. So he comes out of transition, bridges back up to the group, has a breather, has a drink, and just goes right, boys. Bang, bang, bang. See you. see you later. <laughs> and then he's showboating from six hundred meters out, which you never really see with Alex, which is un, un, you know, it's not, it's not a usual thing for him to do, especially with his personality and character. He's more of a humble kind of nice guy, and and he's showboating from six hundred meters out. So you're telling yourself he's still got some gas if you're showboating 600 meters out. So I, I just, I don't, I don't see. And again, I'll eat my hat and I'll be glad to be proven wrong, but I just, I don't know how Christians come to the conclusion that he can match that performance at the moment. Well, what I'll counter and say, just again, you know, Alex pretty well. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, them all pretty well. Alex hasn't won a gold medal. Hayden hasn't won a gold medal. We've seen since the Olympics, both Hayden and Alex in multiple different uh, situations, stumble at the finish line in terms of both Alex and Hayden have not got that, you know, they've not individually, but Alex didn't go very well at the grand final this year. Hayden has missed out on the grand, the world championship title. Well, they both have basically the last couple of years. Uh, Do you think that there is a case to be made that Christian now knows how to deal with the pressure? He's also, you know, he's probably had more pressure on his shoulders at at certain events in the last couple of years than any athlete has. And he's been able to deliver. Do you think that's a factor that needs to be considered? I think what's, what's difficult when you're dealing with the Norwegians and Christian in particular is, is, they're able to do things mentally that a lot of us aren't. So they're able to not take a break, push through all the way, kind of take it further and further and further and further where a lot of guys, you know, and girls need their break, which is, uh, you know, we're human to a certain extent. And I guess that's where they're kind of not is they've, they've been at it now for seven, eight years, banging and banging and banging and banging and, you know, not a single drop of alcohol, not a single party, not a single this. And 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 they've kind of been monk mode for however long. And I think that pays dividends in the end. And um, if you're able to sustain that mentally, which is which is another feat in itself, I don't think many people are, but Christian is one of them who can. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, he knows how to deliver under pressure. He's done it time and time again, 70.3 worlds, world championships, Olympic games. So you, like I said, you can't discount him. I guess the claim that I was mainly disputing is is the run time and the run speed that's required. I just, I don't see if the race goes this, if the race goes the way it went at the test event, I don't really see a path to victory or, you know, for Christian, I see maybe a path to a podium if he's on really good form and he's able to kind of stay with that Berger, Connings, Lacour, a uh, group of six or six, Pearson. I mean, you can't discount Morgan Pearson. This Never. Guy's a 60, Mate, ever. 61 minute, 21, yeah. 61 minute half marathon runner. Yep. 13, 27, 5K, whatever. I don't know his 10K PB, but if this guy wakes up in the right mood on the day of, you know, Paris, he's going all the way. Like well, maybe look, not, him, but he's following Alex. I still love the story about the test event, right? Where he was on the wait list, couldn't even get a start, gets the start, gets the qualification, going to the Olympics. Like just... Phenomenal. And you're right. He's an, I mean, he's already, I think for quite a while I've been verbalizing. I think he's my sort of outside pick for a podium. Cause at the moment it probably yeah. is previous podium. I'd probably still put his, as my podium, but yeah, you're right. I, he's a guy that when he's on is the most dangerous 
you know him or Alex or Hayden, like one of the most dangerous runners in that field. Um, what I remember th- standing on the side of the road in Abu Dhabi at yep. the grand final when you remember they were off the front pack yep. of, pack of six. You had Alex Hayden, everyone in the in the chase. He went through that first five k in like fourteen fifteen, so yep. twenty eight thirty pace, and then he k hold a bit in the heat, but still kind of held it. You got to tell yourself, damn, if he just manages it a bit better and is able to hold even to a 14.30, that's a 28.45. Mm. Like he's a he's a dark horse. If you've if you got 100 quid to put on a... I'm going to. I'm his, going to. <laughs> his, his odds will be good at the tab, mate. Like I'll tell you that. He'll be paying, he'll be paying $3.5, $4, $4, wow. $4 to the dollar. So... What is it last thing? Because I, I put I put I put bets on almost everybody, and I think the only person that I didn't actually put money on to win was Christian because I I, I was I convinced myself that he'd peak too early, and I was like fuck I lost like literally just did not win a dollar <laughs> from the Olympics so I'm gonna be uh probably hedging my bets a little bit maybe not just win maybe I'll put win or place this time yeah you gotta um, do the multi mate you never no, before. I think I did have a multi and I think it said something like if I had have got it right I would have won like oh that was like six figures that was a big amount of money um. But there was a lot of places that were being quite funny about the bets that I wanted to make because I think they didn't have they weren't they weren't confident in their odds or something. So they're like, we're not sure if actually we should be allowing a bet that could make so much so much prize money. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I actually do like having a bit of a flutter uh, on the Olympics. It's one of my uh, rare rare times I'll bet on sport. You're obviously a front pack swimmer though yourself, uh, one of the better swimmers. Do you think the swim is going to be completely irrelevant in Paris, or do you think there is a path to victory? through the swim do you think there could be a group of guys who commit to it commit to a swim bike don't allow that group to catch back up and maybe run away or do you think that it is just by design or by whatever you want to call it a course where that is not going to be possible i think i think a few things need to come into play i think the current is going to be a difficult thing to manage because you can stand on that pontoon all day and observe currents and observe this and observe that it changes it's a river it's constantly changing it's con and you never know whether that side of the pontoon that you looked at half an hour ago is the right one. So I think that the current's going to play a big, a big, a big, uh, a big role in, in, in determining where people come out of the water. But I also think, and I spoke to Christian in, in Neom about this, like he's convinced he's going to be a front pack swimmer next year. And I said, bloody hell mate, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Cause the way you're swimming right now is pretty shocking. <laughs> but you know, if it, it like, look, if Hayden and Christian, within 20 seconds of the front out of the water mm-hmm. i can see a 15 20 man group going away mm-hmm. if they're 45 plus it'll be a 50 man group that's they they are such a huge factor in the bike fa- firepower in short course at the moment that you need them to be towards the front for a group to stay away now leo's on a par on bike strength with him he's extremely strong super aero super good extremely good technically like i'd argue one of the best technically but i just i I feel that the front pack has lost its belief if that makes sense because when you'd see alistair you know you think back leeds 2017 or 2016 he's with johnny he's on his own he's got Raphael lacour on the wheel Raphael and lacour look back five seconds back to the chase they're like ah it's done and alistair knew that if he got to that dead turn at the bottom of the hill that they could stay away, him and Johnny. And you see him shouting at Johnny. Johnny even turns around and says, it's over, mate, it's finished. And Alistair goes, nah, mate, it's not. And just goes, you know, I mean, he said it in a different way than that. but <laughs> I can't imagine that. <laughs> gets to the bottom of the hill and he was bloody right, wasn't he? He had a, mi- he had a minute and a half by the end of the run. Uh, sorry, end of the bike. So I guess I think that belief, you need strong characters and you need leaders in front groups. And I think that sometimes that belief has been a bit lost. Because you don't have those, despite the fact that Berger is such a good athlete, Connix is such a good athlete, like they're not characters in the sense that they're not going to get in someone's face who's not doing anything and be like, look, pal, if you don't get to the front, I'm going to put you in the barrier, which is what Alistair used to do. And well, yeah. that's I was why say, he, that's the two why people, racing. the two people most likely to do that are Hayden and Christian. And they're the ones coming through with the chase back, which is probably half the reason the chase back gets up is you got these two guys screaming at the others, shaking heads yeah. and stuff like and that's that's right. I mean, I've I've said this all along, right? Is it you're exactly right. It just feels like that front pack doesn't seem to commit to trying to stay away because And I also do. think like that it, I and again, they're kind of my boys, you know, the front pack guys. So I can't take a shit on them, but I feel that the courses haven't helped that belief. The mm. courses are so mundane and so flat and so unoriginal in terms of elevation, in terms of technicality, in terms of any sort of aspect that could give you that belief 
that you lose it. You know what I mean? You kind of think to yourself, you look at, you go to course rec, you think, bloody hell, I'm going to roll around here at 55k an hour. Are you going to have big dog Christian and Hayden and Emil Holm and all these massive units coming from the back? Gustav when he's on, Casper when he's on, Thorn when he's on. Like the list is extensive. Messias when he's on. Like yeah, the list, like I said this to Kate a few times where she says, why Why are you guys never staying away? Why?" Are you? And I said, look, you've got one Taylor nib, right? Yeah. And she still brings it back. We've got about seven or mm. eight chasing us. So you try to outride a professional cycling team on a flat course with very little race dynamics other than let's try our best boys. And then I've been in groups where we've been pushing as hard as we can, like Sunderland this year. I was on the, on Leo's wheel. I was at 450 Watts and we still got caught. (laughs) I said, I said to the technical team after the, after the race, like the British triathlon team, I said, what the fuck do we need to do to stay away? Like what, like you're pushing, pushing 450 Watts second wheel. So 500 Watts at the front and you still get caught. Mm. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's mental. That's actually, fuck, that's mind blowing. Oh man, that's, that's yeah, horrific. So to link back to what I was saying, yeah, you need the belief, which I think is kind of gone because of number one, I think the loss of big characters, but number two, also the, the courses, the courses don't encourage aggressive racing. Like if you look at Madrid European champs this year, hard course, technical, proper climb, that race was all over the shop. You had people blowing up left, right and center. But isn't that the way it should be? Mm-hmm. It should be a test of swim, bike, and run. Ponavedra grand final, where we actually did see the group stay away. You didn't. You went back to help um, Alex out. But like, I mean, watching on TV, it looked like it had some climbs. But was that a particularly tough course? Was it a course sort of designed for? Or why do you think the group did stay away that day? Was it that they did commit, or was it that the guys chasing like Alex, like not Alex uh, Hayden, and that had a poor performance? Like, what do you think was the the secret that day? I think the gap was too large at the end of the swim. I think Hayden was isolated for the, for the crucial first two laps and then Christian kind of bridged back on. But by the time Christian was on, there wasn't really much dynamic. Emil wasn't in there. Uh, I think just a bunch of different stuff. I think guys that aren't usually at the front were there and the dynamic was a bit reshuffled by the fact that again, it was a river swim, Mm -hmm. the pontoon, the current affected it loads. Like I, I was, one of the last guys onto the pontoon and mate, I couldn't swim to save myself that day because I just couldn't get, I couldn't break the current. And when I came out and I saw Mark DeVay with me and a bunch of front pack swimmers in the chase, I was like, damn, like what's, what's happening? You know what I mean? <laughs> but um, do, yeah. so could you see that happen? Like when we talked about the current, though, like, is, is that a scenario you could see actually unfolding in Paris where it isn't even about it's luck. Like it could just be a random lucky thing that happens and suddenly you have this group at the front who you wouldn't have expected. And we see a massive upset. Yeah, I mean, I think the current's going to be a huge factor. I mm. mean, you don't know you don't know which guy upstream decides to open and close a dam, or or like uh, how much it rains the week before. Da 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 da. Like, I'm not a river expert, but <laughs> come on, mate. You know, <laughs> I'm not an expert on rivers. But, uh, I can tell you that, yeah, it definitely would. It definitely would play a huge factor. So, I think that's a way that could can completely change the race and and. And if someone comes out where they're not expecting or Christian comes out way higher up the out of the water, like if Christian comes out front pack, it could stay away. Yeah, wow. Well, okay, that'd be exciting. The other thing I find interesting that we are, you know, less than a year out from the Olympics and there's been so much talk about the like the men's and women's events and the excitement about getting the mixed team really added to the Olympics uh, last time. Not a lot of people are talking about the mixed team really. I mean, obviously for you guys, you're all talking about, you know, who's going to get picked, who's going to get the start, but... Like, I don't think there's been that much actual conversation about that event in the lead up, which is funny because I would have thought they would be more based on how good it was uh, in Tokyo. What do you think about that? Yeah, I just think, again, it's all about promoting the sport. And I don't think the, the mixed relay has been harnessed the way that swimming's harnessed their mixed team relay, that athletics has harnessed their mixed team relay. Like, if you go on IAAF or FINA, they pump the mixed team relay because obviously, brands love the gender inclusion they love the diversity they love the the camaraderie that comes with that and i think we've definitely missed the trick we're one of the only sports of a bloody mixed team relay where the two genders compete on the same team and we're not promoting it the way it should be and we're not showcasing that men and women can be on the same team and there can be good dynamics and there can be exciting racing and and it, the mixed team relay is i've been part of i was part of one this year that was we got a medal and i and it was genuinely one of the best times of the year because you're part of a team you're part of a broader 
uh, ensemble of people that are working together towards a goal. So um, I just believe that that we're missing a trick again. Like it's another thing we're missing a trick on is is just kind of promoting that and promoting the fact that countries can field multiple relay teams on and and create exciting racing because the racing in a mixed team relay is always exciting. They like there never is a dull mixed team relay as opposed yeah. to race it as opposed to the individual races. Yeah. There's always something going on. So there's always something to talk about yet. We can't seem to find anything to blim and talk about. Mm. No, again, I just, it, that was just me thinking out loud then. Cause I thought, fuck, we actually haven't been like, that's probably the first time I've discussed the mixed team relay on this show. Fuck, I don't even know since when. So we'll have to, we'll have to do our part on this, on this podcast to, to cover it a little yeah. bit more. Cause again, I think it's, yeah. uh, yeah, I really enjoyed like I that. Think, yeah. I think like, the, the exciting thing, if I can say anything about the mixed relay, the exciting thing about the mixed relay going into Paris is you have a lot more contenders. And I think it's dumb. And I think that's what some countries like Australia made a mistake of in Tokyo was just assuming that because you're wearing the Southern Cross and the green and gold, you're going to be up the front. You're not. Mm, there's, other not. Teams, there's other teams that are good. And this year, even more. So you're looking at the Norwegians that have now got a European champion team. You're looking at the Belgians that were on the podium. You're looking at the Dutch potentially having a team. You're looking at the Germans having an absolute powerhouse team. You're looking at obviously the usual contenders, France, GB, USA, but there's no guarantee France is going to be on the podium. They got fourth at the Blumen Test event. Mm. So do you think that there's an added element of strategy because of that? Because again, in the past, it's sort of like we do it our way, whatever, and you know, we pick this person and this and this, but do you think that because of what you've just said, it's going to be a lot more important about who you pick, which order, which athlete you actually pick. Like, and it, can you, again, I should know this, but do you have to pick the same athletes who may race the, the, the main event have to do the, the relay or can you have separate? So could you have different athletes you pick for the relay and different athletes you pick for the actual um, individual triathlon? Yeah. I mean, it all depends how dirty you're willing to play. Like you're allowed a reserve and then you're allowed, if you've got two slots, if you say one of them's ill or you say one of them's injured, you can use your reserve. So the the short answer is yes, you have to use the same people that are in the individual. We don't have, to answer your question directly, we don't have quotas for relay athletes like athletics, but mm -hmm. who's to stop you, okay. you know? <laughs> okay, I like that's, that answer. That's just, that's just my Jose Mourinho mind. <laughs> <laughs> I think we saw, it was, there were some people I think at the in, in in Tokyo that was there was a reserve situation. I'm, I'm guesstimating now. I think it's, I'm getting old, man. I can't remember that far back. Yeah. But again, it's getting close. We're not that far. It's, it's, when this comes out, it's December, you know, next year's the Olympic year, which again is is just blows my mind to think we got the Olympic yeah. year next year because Tokyo feels like it was last week still. Yeah. Uh, just just shows how weird everything is. But look, enough Olympic chat. We are going to stay kind of on the same thing because there is a race happening this weekend. And while uh, I sort of joked before we hit record that we're going to talk about India Wells 70.3, there is actually some relevance to talking about it because uh, in the addition to athletes like Sam Long, Ben Canute, Jackson Laundry, Mark uh, Mark Dubrick, we've got a couple of Norwegians on this start list, mate. In the men's race, we've got Casper Stornes and Vettel Thorne racing. And then in the women's race, uh, alongside Tamara Jewett, Jackie Herring, uh, so, um, Jody Stimson, we've got Solvay, Love, 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 Love Seth, I think it is. So, yes. mate, it's interesting to see that these uh, these pesky Norwegians are, are, are sort of doing what they do and, and mixing up the distances a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of what I'm doing this year. It's what Kate's done. It's what Taylor Nibb's done. It's what a lot of short course athletes and long, I mean, not so much long course athletes because they can't drop down and do what we do. They'd get smashed, but, um, <laughs> call them yeah. out, mate. Come on. We, hey, had, we, had, we, um, <laughs> we had, we had Hayden wild, but Hayden was on the show. He called that Sam long specifically and said, come on, Sam, come race me in short course. So. I saw, I, you know, I was swimming today and I saw a video that someone had sent on a chat of Sam long saying he's a good swimmer. And he was like, I know I'm a good swimmer. And I was just thinking to myself, like, I think I'm all right. And I've swam, I have I spent a couple months in Noosa, like during COVID swimming with real swimmers. And I was shit. <laughs> so if you're that compared to me, you're not a good swimmer, mate. Like, just take it on the chin. Get back to work. Stop crying in your car. Like, it's fine to not be good at something. You know I, what I mean? Um, I had a similar experience because I think I'm a pretty good swimmer again for a, you know, an amateur. And then I spent a, a couple of sessions in the pool next to you. And thought, Fuck me. I'm terrible. So yes, I can, uh, I can uh, understand that experience quite well. Uh, but yeah, like if the long course guys wanted to do a world series, they'd get destroyed. Like there's, there's I still no think one of my all time favorite, one of my all time favorite memes on the internet is that it's, um, 
it's the picture of the swim star and it's like, you know, six, 67th in a World Cup race and then it's uh, fourth place or fifth place at the Ironman World Championships. It's Cam yeah. Worth running into the water and the pack's about 200 metres off the shore. <laughs> I still think it's one of the best memes I've ever seen. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's... it's no offence. Like, they're great at what they do, but I just find it funny how, like, I just, again, I think it's, I've said it before, like, we don't get our respect. Like, the short course guys don't get the respect for how good they are. And again, to come back to your initial point is the Norwegians mixing up the distances. It's because we can you know what I mean? Like yeah. we are that good that, and it's not me saying I'm that good. It's the the cohort of men and women that race short course are so capable. And, uh, and I think you'll see them do really well. I, I, and I genuinely think that if they, if, if Sam Long and Jackson Laundry think that it's going to be a re a retake of last year, uh, I think they're mistaken. I think Vettel Thorne is an incredible runner, incredible rider. Casper Storn as obviously everyone knows, uh, and compared to them in the water, Casper gets spanked in short course in the water, but he's going to smash them, you know. Yeah. So you could easily see a, a kind of Norwegian armada off the front. Plus, you got Ben Knut and Mark Dubrick, both who are yeah. also very good swimmers. Like they're good at that, you know. They they're competitive at short course as well. So yeah, yeah there's going to be a lot of swim power in that race. And and we, I mean, the only thing to counter that, I suppose, is we've seen Sam Long make up some incredible deficits. Uh, out of a swim this year already so that's the only thing i suppose but yeah yeah and i mean all power to him like if he manages to make it up but he did in oceanside and what did leo do with him played with him like his <laughs> can were you at the arena game because you did some arena games races this year were you at the arena games that lionel raced no 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 i was a i wasn't there no see i really like i really like these sort of things but as much as we joke about it like i actually really appreciate when you see the short course guys step uh, the long course guys step down and like no word of a lie i'm sure you know this but we we tried pretty hard to get joe skipper into the london super league race and joe knew he was going to get absolutely smashed but like as a fan like when lionel signed up for the arena games I, again you knew he was gonna get belted but fucking hell i wanted to see it like just yeah. purely for like fascination but also there's something so like I really respect the athlete who's like willing to cop it on the chin a bit. Like they know they're going to get flogged and they still just want to have a go anyway. I really like that. Yeah. I, and, I, and again, it's not to like tear them down. Like if they want to come, come, you know, like I feel like, I feel like sometimes long course and short course is kind of like boxing in UFC. Yeah. You get these box, like the long course guys are like the boxers and they're like, yeah, I'm the baddest man on the planet. Da, 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 da. And then Francis and Ghani from the UFC is like, all right, mate, come in the octagon. And they're like, oh no, no, let's do a boxing match. It's like, <laughs> Oh, all right. Well, you're not about it when there's jujitsu and where there's like kicking and stuff, but you just want to use your fists. I feel like that's what the long course guys are like sometimes. They're just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll take you, bro. Come and race us. Like, well, how about you come and race the World Series, pal? Like, I, know, you know? I know what I'm going to turn the reel into this week because that's absolutely fantastic. That's the that's the sound grab for this week's episode. Um, but let's actually talk about the action because I think, you know, how do you sort of see the race going? Like, you do you think we're going to see that group get away and just stay away or could a Sam Long bridge up and do you think it could come down to the run? Or do you think that those guys are such well-rounded athletes that even if Sam can bridge up, they'll probably still outrun him? I think you'll see Ben Canute, Dubrick, Stornes, Vernison, Thorne, and I don't know which other Norwegians are racing, I think, but those are the main guys. They'll be in a group of five. They're all very strong on the bike. I think they'll work together. I think Sam, I don't know the course. I think he could bridge up, but he's going to spend so much energy because He's to guys like Casper and Ben, he's going to lose what two and a half, three minutes in the water at Maybe least. More. I don't know, mate. Again, if there's been some pretty bad swim results for Sam, although so, as you said, he thinks he's a good swimmer now. So maybe I don't know, to be honest, is the, is the short answer. So let's say he loses three to four minutes. Like he's going to have to spend so much energy getting back. And by the time he gets back, like Vettel is a, a sub 30 minute 10K runner. Like Vettel runs 30, 30, 30, 20 off the bike. Stornes runs the same. Third at test event, 11th at the Olympics, you know, podium at World Cups. Like this guy's a, a killer, you know, he, they're going to run, they're going to run um, like, I don't know, they're going to run what, at least 110, mm. 109. Yeah, sub 70 probably. So I, 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 I think that even if he starts the run with them, it's no guarantee he's going to run away with it. Like, I don't even I don't think he runs away with it anyway because Canute these performances that he put out in St George last year when he ran with Christian, like he's more than capable of matching Sam on a good day. So, no, I don't think I don't think he's going to have a. I think it, I think this this Norwegian train that's showed up is actually quite a problem for him to be honest. It certainly made me a lot more interested. Like again, I'd seen I'd sort of seen the post with like oh Sam Long's racing 
India Wells. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then it wasn't until I was preparing for this where I went, what? What? Oh, the, the Norwegian, like, and again, uh, Vettel Thorne is an athlete that I am uh, watching with a lot of fascination at the moment because it, you know, he's obviously been the, the thorn in the Gustav Eden side in terms of Olympic qualification. And look, you know, I, I can't see a, a path or a future where he's not picked for the second spot on the Olympic team for, for Norway. I mean, something pretty weird would have to happen for that. To, but so to see him on a start list again, I, I, I said, I love it. I love when you see the athletes mix distances and I'm I, I, like having Vettel Thorne in that race has given me an extra layer of, of fascination. And I'm I'm surprised because there's a few races we're going to talk about of just we're seeing really strong fields for what is you know basically the end of the year and it's not normal and I'm fucking here for it mate like I love that we're seeing these these absolutely stacked races um yeah I don't know what I've got a question but yeah it's it's looking good I I think it's just part of the evolution of the sport and 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 again it's that thing of like it's impossible until someone does it right and that's so cliche but everyone was like, oh yeah, you know, long course is this, you know, oh yeah, you got to wait till you're 30 to transition. And then Christian's like, nah, bro, I'm going to go do it. And then does it. Taylor Nibs like, nah, dude, I'm going to go do it. And then now, you know, Martin's like, nah, I'm going to go win Ford Laser. And then guys like me and Dan and Emil are sitting by and just going, well, I can do that then, you know, like, <laughs> why not? And then that's why we're all in Bahrain. And, and like, I'm not saying I'm going to go out and smash it for my first one but i think i'm going to be hella competitive and i think that emil's going to be hella competitive and i know that martin's going to be hella competitive and i know that henry's going to be hella competitive so i just think it's about what the standard you set for yourself and the standard that the sport sets for itself and if others are doing it and you think to yourself well they're only human why can't i do it and then you do it so why not here's a, okay here's just because what you said and this is sort of a again we're, we're jumping all over this week but that's what we do in this podcast um yeah. We, we've sort of had this period for the last two years where I guess a lot of you guys have been focusing very much on short course as the cycle sort of goes. We've had this group of athletes, younger athletes who've sort of skipped short course, namely Sam Laidlow, Magnus Ditlever, the two obvious names that come to mind. And they've had an incredible amount of success in quite a short period of time. We, we, we're really seeing them. Again, I've said it a hundred times. I, if, if Sam Laidlow continues to have the performance that he had in Nice, I, nobody can beat him. Like it was just fucking, it was such a next level of performance. Is it a case that do you, like do you genuinely believe? Because I think the only thing we might see is that like that next wave that comes in post Olympics, which always happens. Is it that we haven't seen that ne- that 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 next group of short course guys step up? Because I, I mean, I'll die on the hill. I've said it as long as I've been podcasting. I just think that the short course guys have this advantage where they've gone through the system the whole time. Like they they have you know they, these guys are athletes who've done it through a, a you know a structured program for so long that they just they have a natural competitive advantage over the guys who have maybe sort of done it themselves or sort of fumbled their own way there. Do you think that when we see that next wave step up to middle and long distance race and suddenly the Magnuses and the Sams are going to be, have a lot, a lot of other people at their level to compete against? Um, I think that that uh, the answer I'm going to give you is multifaceted. First of all, there's a quote from Fred Van Leer that said, as soon as Alistair and Javier and Johnny come into long course, I'll retire. I think everyone's heard that quote. But what's interesting is they're not the ones that have actually transpired and been good. And I think there's a specific reason for that. I think the training, especially since COVID, pre-COVID, the way we train, so a lot more zone two threshold, building that kind of engine, and then sprinkling in some speed work to kind of get you up to speed for what's needed in in World Series, World Cup, Super League, um, is a lot more suited to transitioning and to doing a hybrid program than the hyper polarized stuff that the guys used to do mid 2010s, mid 2000s. So, you know, a lot of easy, easy when it's easy, hard when it's hard, you know, like that kind of gray zone has a gray zone of training. I'm talking zone two threshold has increased tenfold. So like all the, a lot of the training I do is, 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 is measured, is controlled, but you don't see those like, right boys, we're going to do five by one K three minute static rest, the best pace you can go, you know? And that's, I think that's kind of useful short term, maybe when you're young to kind of enjoy it. But like, now you're looking at guys like me, guys like Christian, obviously Christian's the godfather of it doing, you know, 13 by three minutes, four by 10 minutes. I don't know, like 10 by 10 by five minutes, all thresholds. So like long, hard, boring sessions to lactate, to numbers, to heart rate. And I think that I'm giving you a long answer here, but that that translates a lot more to transitioning and that's why you see that facility and that ease in transitioning and you've also just got people training more like people train more people are more professional people sleep more people recover better 
And that just enables you to have such a wider armory, so to speak, when it comes to, I can do Super League, I can do 70.3, I can do non-draft Olympic distance, I can do World Series, I can do World Cup. Um, so to cut kind of my long explanation short, yes, I think you'll see a lot more people doing hybrid programs. I think you'll see a lot more people stepping up. I think you'll lot, and I think they'll all be very successful. And when I say successful, I don't, I'm not saying they're going to come out and you're going to see all the 70.3s and challenge races next year won by short course guys. I think you're going to see, like we're seeing now, Bahrain, Indian Wells, guys just giving it a go. And I think, you know, top fives, podiums, like they'll be there. They'll be competitive. They won't be ridiculous, which is what kind of, we were before when you had you had this hyper polarized way of training. Now that everyone's kind of understanding that you need to build your engine and you need to be so professional, you you are capable of so much more. Um, and yeah, I think that's why you see younger guys be better now. That's what you know. Like if you listen to Bradley Wiggins talk about why Tade Pogacar, Jonas Vingegaard, Remco Evenepoel were given these roles in such major teams, you know you have back in the day, you had to prove yourself. You had to take your marks. You had to da, da, da. And then by the time you're 28, 30, 31, you're a team leader. Now, if you can push the watts, you're a team leader. Simple. And the guys are able to push that power so much earlier because of the training has got so much more advanced and everyone's so much more professional and so much better. And I think that's it's translating to triathlon is people are able to transition much younger because they're doing more training. They're more professional. They're drinking less. They're, they're sleeping more. They're recovering better. And, and that just translates to a more professional approach and therefore able to race multiple distances. Sorry, I've rambled on, but no. that's kind of a global answer to your question of, yes, I think that's why you're seeing a lot younger guys be a lot better because you've kind of taken off that perception that long course is for old guys. Mm. You know, it's not for old guys. It's for anyone who can manage the training and manage the racing. And that's why you're seeing so many more people be good at it and younger guys be good at it. We've seen it for a while now where the, the men tend to sort of switch between the two. We've been seeing it for, you know, a long, you know, Ben Canute was always the golden sort of like we used to say the most versatile athlete in the sport. And then Christian came and did his thing. And, you know, he is probably the most versatile athlete in the sport. And then, you, you know, you said it, we've had Martin Van Riel, you know, break the board record in Dubai, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The women, we haven't really seen that same amount of, of, of switching. I mean, I think Taylor Nib is, she's the female Christian Blumenfeld in terms of, you know, being as versatile as she is, but, We've also seen Ash Gentle, who was a very good uh, short course athlete and sort of transition, you know, commit to middle distance and just dominating. Like because of what an athlete like Ash has done and because of what we need to see Taylor doing, sort of, you know, doing both, do you think we are going to see more women start to do that as well? Or like, because I've asked a few female triathletes this question is, is why do you think it isn't as common for females to sort of go between the distances as it is for the men? Like, do you, do you have an idea about what that might be? Yeah. Again, this might be a bit of a long-winded answer, but. I think first and foremost with females, you've got, you've got to talk about injury risk. You've got to talk about hormonal changes. You've got to talk about bone stress injuries. You've got to talk about prevention. And what's difficult is the fact that it is, they, you know, women can't take on the same huge load that guys can, because unfortunately they're just not, the bodies aren't as sturdy and, and you get a lot more bone problems. You get a lot more tendon problems. You get a lot more just injuries, breakdowns kind of, you know, everything that goes along with being a woman, which is extremely difficult to manage an endurance sport and why it's a huge credit to any girl that's at the top, even not at the top, even just doing it to be doing it because it's not easy, you know, and I see it myself. Like, I mean, I'm in a very powerful women's group and, and the way that they kind of get on with it and, and, and deal with things that men never have to deal with is a testament to how strong they are as women. And, and I think, so parking that thought is, I think you see, that kind of wariness of like, oh, I've got to crank my mileage. Oh, I've got to, you know, do TTs. Oh, I've got to, you know, you get a bit of a wariness of injury because of, of previous injuries. And obviously you got that trauma of like, damn, I was in a boot for six months, three years ago. Like, I don't want that had to happen again. I'll just play it safe. Whereas men are kind of just like, ah, oh, just, just get on with it, mate. Just rip it. You know, like it's a very different mindset. And I think the men, when they see Christian doing it, they think, well, you know, I can do that. You know, like, oh, I can do that. Whereas I think women are a lot more tentative and a lot more thoughtful when they think and about doing something that, you know, they think they they risk assess and they think, you know, is this, uh, is this the best thing? Like, maybe I should build it. And then men are just kind of like, nah, let's do it, you know? And, um, and I think that's why you see more guys doing it. But no, to answer your question, I think you will see a lot more women transition because like I said, the training's evolved. And I think that the women, so I'm talking like, obviously Kate, 
one in, in thingy. You see Julie Daron, who was there as well, who was fifth in Edmonton. Um, but you'll see a lot more girls like Caldwell, Taylor Brown, uh, Alice Spivey, Spivey, um, Lombardi. I don't know, like the list goes on. Gian Lahair, maybe? I think Gian Lahair could do quite well at uh, middle distance. Yeah, she just needs to get a decent bike because her road bikes are fucking shambles, man. I can't even imagine what they're <laughs> Um, Yeah, so again, I think you've got enough strong girls there to be extremely competitive. Like, you look at Ash, like she's she, she still won Noosa, which is a short, short, short course race a couple of weeks ago mm. in front of the whole Australian short course team. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, it wasn't a good look, was it? <laughs> not, not the best, eh? Well, look, let's talk about the women's race because we, we, we've sort of touched on the men's race in Indy Wells. And I did say we've got Solvay from Norway racing, but we've also got Tamara Jewett, uh, Jackie Herring, and of course, uh, Great Britain's own Jody Stimson, Jody Bean and the Commonwealth Games, God Mellis, who has had a relatively rough trot of it uh, over recent years. But I mean, looking at this, Tamara, or Tamara, sorry, you know, has got possibly the strongest run in female triathlon at the moment, middle distance probably more specifically, but how do you see that going? Do you think that it's just going to be Solvay's day or do you think a Tamara Jewel will run through like she has in the past? Or, you know, maybe we're seeing the new Jody Simpson is going to come back and, and start that pathway back to the form we've seen her have before. I think uh, this is the only way I've seen it going. I think Solveig is going to have a decent swim. And I think I've seen, I've heard about her numbers on the bike, her threshold numbers. And if she's aero and if she's on a good bike, which I, I I'm confident she is because the Norwegians don't, don't play oh, around yeah. with, with, with stuff like that. Uh, I think she's going to put about two and a half, three minutes into the girls on the bike. And then I think you might see Tamara run back up to her, depending on how Solveig's running is, because it's still a bit hit and miss, despite the fact she had a bit of a purple patch mid-year in terms of her running. I think if her running's on, Solveig will win. And I think if her running's not quite on, I think she'll come off of two, three minutes lead um, and Tamara will run her down. Okay, excellent. Again, and another star list where I'm, I'm 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 happy to see Jody Stimson back on again. I have a lot of time for Jody Stimson, uh, but again, the addition of Solvay certainly made me go, okay, this is cool. Again, I just I just like that we see that sort of mix up. Um, other races happen though. We got some that are coming up, and then maybe, should we should we continue with what's coming up, or do you want to go to something that happened over the weekend? How do you want to approach this? Uh, let's 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 do a flashback before we look forward. Challenge Canberra, the inaugural Challenge Canberra happened in the nation's capital of Australia, the, the delightful swim in Lake Burley Griffith. Uh, followed by a run, a swim and a, a swim and bike and a run, that's triathlon. Uh, but we saw Dane, uh, Daniel Beckergaard, friend of the podcast, uh, dominate the race, including a, a crash actually, ahead of Kurt McDonald in second and Caleb Noble in third in the women's race. Actually turned out to be quite a close race with Elza Visa uh, beating Fenella Langridge by, I think it was something like, you know, what have we got, nine seconds, 10 seconds. Like it was it was right down to the wire uh, with Rad Carterfelt, you know, sort of six minutes back. But um, I did, I did a Canberra 70.3, I think in 2012, and then middle distance racing seemed to leave the nation's capital. So to see it can make its uh, triumphant return in the form of challenge, uh, is good. And to see, you know, some, some real European powerhouses on a, you know, what is it, in effect a local Australian race was pretty cool. Yeah, no, agree. Definitely. I think people forget how, how big of a country Oz was for triathlon once and to see races come back to to places and new places in 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 the country is is great and i've trained in canberra you know multiple times on camps on weekends with family and i i feel like it gets bashed on a lot within australia people if you tell people you're from canberra people are oh, you know, unlucky like, <laughs> unlucky kind of like shithole whatever but it's not i genuinely think it's one of the best places to train in oz um the trails are great the roads are great and i think bring an event there might just highlight the fact that it actually is a good place for endurance sport and it's a good place for a race. Like it, it is genuinely a good place for a race like that lake in front of parliament house. Then you can run along Lake Burley Griffin, see all the sites. Like it's a, it's a man-made city in the fact that it's literally designed to the centimeter um, by Mr. Burley Griffin, which is hence the name of the lake. Yep. Um, therefore, I think it's a great way to showcase a place that people might not, you know, necessarily think when they think of Australia, they think of Bondi beach, they think of the gold coast, they think of the outback, whatever, but there are other nice places in the country and play good places to hold a race. And I think if that can be kind of the first of many in terms of long course, but also maybe a short course return to, to Australia, then that would be great because it's a shame to see such a big country historically kind of have such an epic downfall over the last four years in terms of not only the Federation's results, but, and management, but, you know, the racing gone, Malulabar 20 plus years gone, mm -hmm. you know, 
Like that's such a shame. The amount of iconic sprint finishes between David House, Laurent Vidal, Brad Carlefelt, you know, Jake Burt we saw like they what why aren't we having that race anymore? You know, it's just a, it's a total shame. And you know, I still I know you still got Port Macquarie, Noosa. Noosa is such a good race. Again, you said at the top of the show that you'd recommend anyone to do Gunu Phuket. I'd recommend anyone to do Noosa. That race is unbelievable. It's the best triathlon you'll ever do. 40,000 people, a whole week's worth of events, legends races, kids races, bike races, run races. And I again, comes back to what I said at the top of the show. I really wish there were more kind of events like that, iconic, historic um, quality events. I think one of the things I do like with what we've seen challenged in particular, because it, it seems like they're on a rampage lately. Every time I open my... Um my uh you know triathlon news websites it sounds like there's another challenge race i know they announced challenge gallipoli for example but this canberra race seemed to be quite a tough course it wasn't just a standard sort of ironman fast as possible designed for speed course it had some serious climbing i know that a, a friend of mine who did the olympic distance had nearly 500 meters of elevation across 40 kilometers like we're talking about you know proper i mean far, by sort of triathlon says like a proper tough course and i i really respect that i think that we we have seen this tendency for races to become flat fast and easy uh and I mean, designed for, I guess, less fit athletes sometimes or for people who are chasing a, a time goal. So to see a race actually, you know, fuck that. We're going to make it a bit tough. I I, I really like, like, and again, uh, I know that Daniel Beckergaard had a crash. I, I don't know the exact details, but I'm guessing maybe it was during a descent or, or something like that. But I think it's good to see some, some harder races return to the circuit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, hard races all day, please. You know, like that, that's what, that's what the athletes, I think if you ask them, um, an overarching majority of the athletes, they, they like it when it's a proper swim, bike and run, you know, and uh, fast times are great, but does it really test who the best triathlete on the day was? I don't know. I know that personally, a lot of the guys I speak to, you know, you just love that satisfaction of having done a complete effort and not felt like, you know, you've come across the line in 17th, but I was, I could see the podium and it was just a big shootout. Like we might as well just screw the swim, screw the bike. Let's just line up and do a 5k lads. Like at the end of the day, that's what people want. And in long course as well, people, you know, you want a challenging course. You want something that's going to test you. And and it and it's a sense of achievement when you've achieved. So like if you break it down to the core kind of aim of triathlon is to test your physicality. And 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 I think that's good. I think it's good to keep entertaining courses. And I think it's good to to promote entertaining courses. Well, on a course that is, the, I guess, the complete opposite and is actually often not a swim, bike and run. We also have Ironman Western Australia happening this weekend uh, over in Bustleton, a race that has been cancelled more times because of shark signs, I think, than any other race maybe in the world. Uh, similar start, li- start list or athletes that we saw in Canberra. We've got Fenella Langridge, Els Visa uh, in the women's, but we've also got the addition of Lottie Wilms, who we know is a very good swimmer um, from the Netherlands. Netherlands? Yeah. Um, Lisa Norden, the silver medalist from, from London, the Swede. And then we've got Michelle Vesterby, uh, who is also going to be there in the women's race and in the men's race, Daniel Becker guards race. And again, the addition of Sam Appleton, Steve McKenna and Caleb Noble is also going to be there again. Uh, Bustleton, a race that you, in- are you interested in or are you worried about, should the Sharks be worried about you, Max, or are you a bit worried about the Sharks? Yeah, I'll tell you what, the size of them things out West, I'd be concerned about a great white biting off my right Me leg. Man, it's fucking yeah. huge. I've never done that race and I don't particularly want to just because for that exact reason, right? Like uh for our non-Australian listeners who are most of you actually, yeah. Uh the sharks in Western Australia and South Australia tend to be the the bigger, badder ones. So it's I had a, I have a mate called uh Jared Port who went to the Olympics for the uh 10k open water swim and went off the front for like 9.6k of that race. Anyway, total legend, Australian swimmer. And he used to do the swim that where you swim back from rottenness, rottenness on, on, yeah. And he's won that a couple of times. And what's that like, forty k or something, thirty k, yeah, something like that. Right, crazy distance. And he was like, I said, mate, how the hell do you keep your head for thirty, forty k in open water in Western Australia? Like, you're talking about one of the most shark infested regions in the world. And he was like, oh, it's funny because there's a chopper following the lead. Like, there's a, a boat, not a chopper, sorry, a boat following the lead swimmers. And he, he said, every time I'd breathe to my left and look at the boat, there'd be a guy with a double barreled shotgun ready to, ready to light it up if something ever went south. And I was like, mate, sorry, but that's no, that's no comfort to me. That race. It's funny you tell that story because my brother has a friend who's also done the race and he tells a story that, cause they, I think every person who swims gets a kayak, like every swimmer has a, a, a kayak who is sort of a system. And yeah. this guy was swimming and his kayaks vanished for a while. And he's like, you know, I can try to keep his head in the game. He's like, the fuck is my, like, I'm, I'm going to be out here by myself. Like, this isn't good. This is shark infested waters. Anyway, 
finishes the race and he's a bit angry. He's like, seriously, dude, like the fuck? You had one job to do. You're meant to just sort of, he's like, mate, there's a fucking great white shark that wouldn't you leave you alone? I was trying to scare the fucker off. <laughs> oh my God. Fuck that. Fucking, uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, they, again, uh, we're doing a good job of advertising Western Australia to our listeners. Go do the Rotten Air Science Women uh, I'm in Western Australia. You'll have a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Genuinely. I mean, this, look, the swim be, might be, be fast. Yeah. It'll be a good race. Uh, they're good fields, men and women. Uh, it's going to be a, probably a fast course because Western Australia is pretty flat. Uh, I'm not too sure what the temperatures like this year, but that you know, West, you know, Bustleton can get really, 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 really dry, hot. So if they haven't prepared in the heat, which I think most of them have, Els has been in Brisbane. Uh, Daniel Sam, been on the Sunshine Coast. How long has Sam been in Boulder? Because I know that Sam lives in Boulder now. And I think I've seen because I follow him on Strava. I know Sam, but I wonder how long he's been in Australia. For probably a few weeks. But that might not be the yeah. ideal preparation, but we'll see. Uh, I think I think you'll see Els Vissa, like she had such a strong performance in Kona, like riding up through that bike pack before her pedal fell off. Um, I, I don't know. I just think she's going to be really good. I think you might see another battle with her and Fenella and Lisa, maybe a three-way kind of boxing match in that way. And then Don't and then discount I- Lottie Wilms. Lottie Wilms is an incredible swim biker. So I think she's also yeah. one who's going to factor in massively as well. You know, we've seen her almost every race she does at the front for a big part of it. So I think that there's, you know, there's plenty of swim bike power in that race. Fenella and Lottie together, I think could do some real damage. And uh, again, Lisa Norton as well, like crust almighty. She's not a layabout. So. Yeah. So good racing, good, good end of year field. Again, like another, another field where there's lots to talk about, lots of talking points and and lots and lots of quality athletes that could have very well just called their season and enjoyed Christmas, but instead they're putting themselves out there in, in, in Bustleton and, and, and again, testament to the growing density and growing, growing competitiveness of the pro field, I guess. Mm. With the men, I'm particularly, again, I think Daniel's not going to quite have the easy day that we sort of would assume he does. Uh, you know, Sam is very, very good. And I think a lot of people forget that that year that Alistair uh, won Western Australia, Sam was right there with him off the bike and then got dropped like a bad habit on the run. But uh, Steve McKenna too is one of the most underrated uh, guys sort of doing the sport at the moment. He's very good in Australia, but sort of struggles overseas. But I think that we've seen him have some really good performances this year and he's taken a bit of a gap. So if, if Steve has been sort of laser focused on this, he's definitely somebody that I think could be uh, very dangerous on that course as well. So again, uh, watching it with interest, it's going to be good. Definitely. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about is about a race that is happening next weekend in the Middle East, uh, Bahrain 70.3, only because we are having a guest on next week. So we probably won't get to do a race preview. And I thought, Considering you're doing the race, it might be a good chance to actually talk about it with you because Bahrain 70.3 Middle Eastern Championships, uh, it is the, I think, fastest 70.3 course ever done. Uh, It is a race that I have done many times and I really, really love this race. You know, last year was so horrifically hard, but so good. Um, And this year we have a particularly, again, sort of on theme with this episode, amazing feel with uh, yourself, Alistair Brownlee, Henry Schumann. Uh, Dan Dixon, Emil Holm, Martin Van Riel, women. We've got Cat Matthews, Amelia Watkinson. Like, th- there's some real talent going to Bahrain uh, next week. What are your thoughts about the race, mate? Yeah, look, I mean, for me, it's a bit of an adventure. You know, it's a, it's the end of the year. I've had a long year. I've been racing short course all year, Super League, and I had a success in Laguna. Uh, but yeah, I'm just looking forward to kind of going out there, giving it my best. And I think a few of the lads, like short course lads, were going to race this like a short course race. So kind of feel sorry for any long course rate or long course guy there so get ready to get your legs ripped off boys and arms ripped off especially so i'm um i'm so keen to see emil holm uh on this bike course yeah. like he's gonna be fucking out oh, of man like he, I, i've seen his setup i've seen he's putting up the questions about the helmets to use and uh, emil is also a patron of this podcast so i have to give him some love is he? he's a patron of this podcast he loves it mate he's a frother ah! <laughs> I, love, um, I fucking love you know that emil and dan are fucking they're legends them. they're, they're, they're so such cool. legends i have so much time for both of them um i i am like genuinely so excited for this race again martin van real one of my all-time favorite guys to do the sport uh, Alistair Brownlee who's had again a very up and down year yourself you know I, I think there's so much to get excited about this race and it, it's such a good course there's nowhere to hide on this course right like there's yeah. there, there's it's 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 a pure time trial lock in error position push watts and yeah. then back up with a run like it is a is a fucking honest course uh, uh, here's a hot take I genuinely think this could be the fastest swim bike you've ever seen in a 70.3 I've I'm not sure really... about the run because we could tear each other the smithereens <laughs> And then just jog it in for a 120. But like the swim, like we're, we're Henry's there, one of the best. Uh, sorry, I didn't even mention Henry. Christ. 
like one of the fastest swimmers of all time in short course like Alistair, we're gonna swim, you we're like, gonna swim our asses off you know yeah. and then on the bike we're gonna go 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 because like emil dan myself like we're used to one thing it's the first 10k full gas and like there's no management and i think there will be some management obviously because you can't race it exactly the same but you'll have a lot of inexperienced young short course guys which might completely ruin the dynamic you've got about you've got about five kilometers i think because you sort of go out and you do this big loop to get up on the highway and once you hit that highway mate fuck me like especially last year we had a massive tailwind going out and i think i think i turned around to 45k mark and i was was i I averaged like 48 kilometers an hour or something this is me and then I turned around. It was just like fucking boom. Oh no! <laughs> it was it was horrible. Yeah. But the wind can turn as well. Like the first year I did it, I think it was no wind, and then turn around had tailwind. I ran out of gears on the way back, going over fifty k an hour. And because the highway is still like technically open, you've got one lane, so there's cars. So you get that funnel that sort of pulls yeah. you along as well. Man, just be comfortable in the aero position and make sure you've got some good gearing on the bike because you you will run out of gears at some point on that race. And then the run is quite loopy and technical like it's many laps and you 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 sort of up and down very close to each other a lot of times so it can get a bit tight yeah. but it's a uh it's a phenomenal race and really they put on such a good event like i, I cannot yeah. speak more highly of the middle east as a racing location and you get the the coveted puffy jacket uh finisher jacket mate. it's probably one of the only finish I, yeah. items you want to keep so i cannot speak highly enough of the middle east in general i love that place mate like yeah. genuinely like every time we go to neom dubai abu dhabi bahrain qatar you get such the hospitality is unbelievable. Yeah. The events are run so well. It's so professional. Uh, you get treated like royalty. And I just think if we can see a growth in, in events in the Middle East, I'm up for it. You know, if that's well, short course, long course, anything. Yeah. That's one thing I'll definitely say you will notice. And I, I was sort of surprised by the first time I went there is you can actually see the impact that the sport is having there. Like so many of the locals are tap, you know, I think there's so many people local to Bahrain who, who participate in the event, which I think is again, just such a positive so, uh, yeah, I think the race is going to be interesting. I, I, I am, like I said, really, really keen to watch this. And then again, the women's race, anytime you've got Kat Matthews on a start list. Again, who's had a bit of a bumpy year this year. Uh, I think she's going to go out there with fire in her belly and Amelia, who just won um, Melbourne 70.3 with a point to prove. Yeah. Uh, I've heard that she's biking the house down. So it's going to be pretty exciting to see yeah, that race. Here's, well. here's a hot take for the women's. You know, you got Emil's sister racing and home. I did not realize that actually. Yeah. And she's a beast on the bike as well. So i reckon she could throw a bit of a spanner in the works i'm not saying take the take the win but like that's i think you're not far from the podium like she's she's well, a some solid athlete there's some good bike pair in that women's race again cat and amelia are no slouches either so that could actually be some yeah man it's gonna be good uh, f1 tracks also fuck they did it again i need to work out how to turn that gesture thing off um hey, they're just loving what you're saying the crowd love it but the worst part of the race is actually f1 track to be honest because the the chip's quite loose or quite rough yeah. But if you are not making car noises as you go around those corners, you've failed yourself as a as a person, mate. Because every year I do it, I still like vroom, you go down the pit yeah. lane. But it's it's a good time, but you'll have a, a good time. Just like I have had a good time chatting with you this week, Max. Thank you so much for filling in for James. Uh, if people want to find out more about you, where you are, give you a follow, uh, get your tips for the Olympics and who to bet on, where do they need to go? Max underscore Stapley at Instagram, uh, Max Stapley on Strava, Max Stapley on LinkedIn you know hit me up plug with, again hit, 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 <laughs> plug it again baby Link, hit me up with any fruitful commercial opportunities max stable at hotmail.com email me anything you know any you know paypal anything <laughs> i'm open to it you can also be found on triathlon mockery where you are the triathlon mockery sponsored athlete and you do the episodes with joe when uh, tom's uh, on holidays and stuff like that i i highly recommend everybody listen to the latest one it was a good time i uh i, I always enjoy when you're on in fact the bonus episode you and joe did a couple of weeks ago uh, i was listening to it. i was packing my bike up in phuket and uh, there's a few times i had to stop because i was laughing quite hard uh, but uh <laughs> yeah give it a listen hashtag don't cancel me <laughs> but uh if people want to find out more about talking triathlon uh it's uh, at talk triathlon on twitter at Talking Triathlon on Instagram. I'm at T Ford 14 on Instagram at TJ Ford 14 on Twitter. Patreon.com forward slash Talking Triathlon is where you can sign up, support the podcast. Thank you to everybody who has. As I said, we've just released another bonus episode this week. We've renamed it The Rumor Mill. Uh, again, if you want to get the, the hot gossip on what's happening in the sport, that is the best place to do it. But again, no snitches. What stays on the, what's behind the paywall stays behind the paywall. Max, a pleasure as always, mate. I'll talk to you later. See you later, mate. Thank you.